In chapter 13 of Leviathan, Hobbes laid out what he took to be the natural condition of humankind outside of any sort of civil society, lacking any sort of government, any sort of power that could enforce moral or legal norms. And as we've seen, it's not a very pretty picture. Life becomes nasty, brutish, and short, in part because we're led into conflict with each other, not necessarily all the time, but sooner or later, and we can't rely upon ourselves being safe and enjoying <clears throat> any sort of prosperity, any sort of security. Towards the end of chapter 13, he says, reason suggests to us articles of peace. These are the laws of nature. And he also talks about several, as he, what we might call useful passions. And remember, passions are things that are stemming ultimately from our desires and our aversions, their expressions of those, um, they're part of what it means to have a living body. And these are things that he thinks that you can take for granted in, if not necessarily everybody, pretty much close to that, the, the vast generality of human beings. We fear death. And in the state of nature, you have to fear death nearly all the time because unless you manage to win the lottery and become so powerful that you can, as he says, overmaster all other, all other men, um, you're going to be liable to get killed by some guy who comes down the road and wants what you have or doesn't like the way that you're looking at him or thinks, you know, that guy looks kind of tough. I better kill him before he kills me. So fear of death is ubiquitous in the state of nature, but that's something that can actually get us out of the state of nature. That's not quite enough to, to, to get us to, to move that way. We need further motivation. One of those is, he, he has a different phrase. He doesn't say nice things, but that's the way we talk about it today, right? Like when you, you tell people, we can't have any nice things. He calls it desire are of such things as are necessary to commodious living. That's nice things. That, that's the sort of things that people like to have. Now, again, in a state of nature, could you have anything like that? Could you have a nice yard? Could you have a nice house or apartment? Could you have a nice car? Could you have um, any sort of nice clothes? No, because people would take them away from you. Or you'd have to fight all the time for them, and they'd probably get wrecked in the process. And even if they didn't, you'd constantly be worried about it. So there wouldn't actually be anybody to produce any nice things either. The last thing that he says is we also need hope. Remember what hope is. Hope is a desire that has some sort of expectation of being fulfilled. So he says um, that, you know, hope by their industry to obtain the things that are necessary for commodious living, the nice things. Once we have those desire in place, desires, sorry, and we start to reason about, well, how would I actually get these things? we're ready to move out of the state of nature. So you, you could say that the fuel comes from the passions, but it's really reason. That distinctively human faculty that gets us out of the state of nature. Remember too that reason is something that we have the capacity for but we have to develop which means that not everybody is going to automatically reason out what it is that Hobbes is, is saying we ought to be able to do. That's a sort of in principle. Now when we do that we come up with what he calls laws of nature or articles of peace. And he says, a law of nature, lex naturalis in Latin, is a precept or general rule found out by reason by which a man is forbidden to do that which is destructive of his life, that which is going to, you know, lead to death, or which taketh away the means of preserving the same, and to omit that by which he thinks it may be best preserved. <coughs> so a law of nature is something, it's, a, it's an imperative, it's a rule that reason in us, not reason coming from God above or anything like that, but reason in us says, look dummy, don't do that, because if you do that, you're going to get killed. Or, you know, hey, if you want these nice things, what do you need to do in order to get them? I'm, I'm being a little facetious there. 
but you can think about reason in us as sort of that, you know, that, that voice internally that's saying, well, I think you should th consider this. This would be a good idea for you to do. So what are these laws of nature? Hobbes actually has, you know, quite a few of them. I'm not going to talk about every single one because they're not all as relevant to our particular emphasis in this class, but the first three are really important because the first three are going to lead us to what we call a social contract. This notion of the social contract is not unique to Hobbes, but he is one of the very important early promoters of this idea. So when people talk uh, in, in, in contemporary moral debates about, well, what about the social contract? Or haven't you, you know, made an implicit social contract? In part, that thought is, is going back to Hobbes. And Hobbes thinks that it's reason that suggests to us what the social contract ought to be. So the very first law of nature has two parts. Human beings ought to seek peace if possible. Why should they seek peace? Because think about it, if they're afraid of dying and they want to have nice things and they would you know, have the hope of obtaining them, then what's going to be the necessary means to having that? It sure isn't going to be being at war with everybody or being in potential conflict. It's going to be to have some sort of state of lasting peace. So, as Hobbes says, um, you know, the first branch uh, is seek peace and follow it. That means do what it takes in order to attain and maintain a condition of peace, a condition in which you're not in conflict with others. That's if it's possible. If it's not possible, that's where the second part comes about. Protect yourself by any means necessary. Hobbes is willing to say that if you cannot come to an agreement with other people and, you know, they might kill you, go ahead and kill them. Um, because if they won't come into an agreement with you, if they won't enter into society with you, they're going to be dangerous. If you're willing to do what it takes to have a social contract in place so everybody can be more or less happy, more or less secure, and they're not willing to do it, you have to use every means available at your disposal to protect yourself because nobody else is going to do it, according to Hobbes. So, he says, from this fundamental law of nature by which men are commanded to endeavor peace, that is to strive for peace, is derived the second law. Now, I've paraphrased it a little bit. Give up some rights if others are willing to do so. What Hobbes actually says is a little bit more uh, complex. He says, a man be willing when others are so too, as far forth as for peace and defense of himself, he shall think it necessary to lay down this right to all things and be contented with so much liberty against other men as he would allow other men against himself. So there's a lot of moving parts to that phrase, right? Let's sort of work through them one at a time. If other people are willing to live in a state of peace, then we don't have to do this thing about, you know, protecting ourselves, even if it means killing everybody else in the world. Instead, what we can do is we can start to think about, well, what would that actually take? What do I need to give up? What do I want them to give up as well? And it's going to be a, a more or less, you know, level playing field. There's going to be equality. If, if I give something up, you're going to give that same thing up. Because I'm not giving it up unless you're going to do the same thing. If I'm going to say, I'm not going to go into your cupboards and take your canned goods, you better not be doing that to me. If, uh, you know, if we're going to get as prescriptive as saying, no loud music after 10, if that applies to me, that applies to you as well. There's no favorites, at least at this point. We'll see that there is one favorite coming up. But there's no favorites for the, the human beings contracting out of the state of nature into the social contract. Um, now, notice that you have to give some things up in order to do this. He says that um, I will lay down this right to all things that I enjoy in the state of nature and be contented. Not just saying, 
oh, you know, I'll try to get over on you or something like that, but I'll be contented with as much liberty against other people as I allow them against myself. So if I am willing to allow them to say mean things about me, I get to say mean things about them. If I don't want them to say mean things about me, I don't get to say mean things about them, and so on and so on. So, you know, we rule out certain things like stealing or killing or, you know, breaking and entering or turning each other's cars over or setting booby traps. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of things that we would have to rule out on these, these, uh, thing, on these sort of con, con, con conditions. Conditions and considerations. I had a little brain... Uh, slow down there for a second. Third law. This one kind of sums them up. Um, I'm going to come back to the second law in a minute because he has a lot more to say about what goes into this. The third law is at the beginning of chapter 15, and he says that what it consists in is that men should perform their contracts made. Meaning that if I make an agreement with you, I should follow through on that agreement. Why? Well, because if I don't, then the social contract is going to break down, and then I'm back in the state of nature where I'm probably going to die. And I'm not going to have the nice things that I want, and nobody's going to have any nice things, nobody's going to make any nice things, and it's going to be worse for everybody. So not only do I have to abide by the basic, fundamental, we all agree to do this, but if I make an agreement with you, I need to follow through on that agreement because otherwise I'm risking throwing society into chaos. I'm treating myself as if I have the right to throw it all away just because I want some temporary advantage. Um, now, I said that we'd come back to this notion in the, in the second of, of contracting. What is contracting? He says it means laying down a right, divesting oneself of some liberty. Um, and how do we do this? He says, well, we can do it either by renouncing it or by transferring it to another. So if I have a right to carry this piece of chalk and I give up that right, I, I can't carry the piece of chalk anymore. But I could give it to somebody else and say that person will, will have that right. We could do this with, say, killing. We could say, well, the rest of us can't kill anybody, even if that person is being mean to us or scaring us or something like that. But we will transfer that right to somebody else who will have the power to do that without thereby destroying the social contract. Now, there are a number of other rules, and these are all in chapter uh, 15, that we do want to look at. Um, some of them are, are quite important. Some of them are a little bit less important. There's one, for example, about, you know, if somebody's coming with a white flag, you don't shoot at them. It doesn't really apply too much to our circumstances. But many of these do apply to, to our, our condition right now. So the third one, as we saw, is, you know, men perform their covenants made. If, if you don't have that, then when people make agreements with each other, nobody's going to trust anyone, and you're not going to have a social contract. You're going to have the state of nature just, you know, with a little bit of lip service to this, and people are going to start acting like fools again and, and attacking each other, and it's, it's going to break down. So what else do we um, need to do? He talks about several other um, laws of nature. And here we go. Um, he says, as justice depends on antecedent covenant, that is, justice depends on, a, on an agreement, so does gratitude depend on antecedent grace. It's interesting, isn't it, that Hobbes is going to bring up gratitude as something that we should build into the social contract, something that we ought to see as a law of nature. Now, what does it mean to be grateful? Hobbes sets the bar pretty low. He, his, his actual formulation is that, um, here we go, um, a man who receives benefit from another of mere grace, that is, you know, without some requirement, endeavor that he which giveth it have no reasonable cause to repent him of his goodwill. So somebody does something nice for us, we don't act like a jerk to them, we don't make them say, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Um, that's a little bit, you know, like I said, that's setting the bar a little bit low for what gratitude counts as. You know, he doesn't even say, like, you need to say thank you or anything like that. 
But it's, it's interesting to see that a trait like gratitude would be built into the laws of nature and be part of the social contract. It's part of what you need in order to have a well-functioning society. We can't all be ingrates. We can't all expect things of each other, even if we have no right to them. Um, he goes on and he says that, um, you know, here's the reason. No man giveth but with intention of good to himself. And so if, if, if we're, you know, giving to other people and they act like jerks towards us, we're going to stop giving. And then society is not going to work as well. Um, he goes on and he says, the fifth law of nature is complacence. That is to say, every person should strive to accommodate himself or herself to the rest. Don't be a person who, you know, requires that everybody else change around you. Be complacent. Not complacent in the sense of like sitting back, but complacent in the sense that you can get along with other people. He says, we may consider that there is in men's aptness to society a diversity of nature rising from their diversity of affections. Not unlike to that we see in stones brought together for the building of an edifice. So don't be the stone that's all crooked and can't be fit in with the others because then they're just going to throw you out. You're not going to be in the social contract if you can't get along with other people. If you can, you can be part of one big group. Um, he then talks about some other laws that have to do with how we deal with people breaking the rules. He says, a sixth law of nature is, upon caution of the future time, a man ought to pardon the offenses past of them that repenting desire it. Uh, pardoning doesn't mean like liking them or anything like that. It just means saying, I'm not going to take any revenge on you. Um, that's something that we do need in order to maintain a society in part because a lot of times people will give offense without even realizing that they're giving offense, without intending to do it. And if we take offense and then act on that offense at every possible you know, opportunity, we're going to be back in the state of nature again. Uh, in the, the seventh law, he says, in revenges, that is retribution of evil for evil, men look not at the greatness of the evil past, but the greatness of the good to follow. So, for example, when we're punishing criminals, should we punish them, you know, just because we get a kick out of hurting them? Or we say, look, you killed somebody, so they're, and you tortured somebody, so therefore we're going to torture you and kill you? Or should we do what's needed for the benefit of society for what we call deterrence, for the good to come in the future? Um, he talks about an eighth law of nature, very, very important one. Uh, he says, no person by deed, word, countenance, that's your, your face, or gesture, declare hatred or contempt of another. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Not really followed in our society, certainly not in social media, where, you know, liberals and conservatives say horrible things about each other. Religious people and anti-religious people say horrible things about each other. Hobbes would say, look, if you're doing that, you're actually setting yourself up to rip the fabric of society apart. Reason should suggest to you that if, you, if you're motivated by these things, you follow the laws of nature and you don't call people mean names. You don't, you know, show that you dislike people. You try to get along with them. If you can't say, you know, I'll remember, if you can't say something nice, don't say something at all, Hobbes would say. Um, he says, uh, on this law depends another. At the entrance into conditions of peace, no person required to reserve to himself any right which he is not content should be reserved to any one of the rest. So we treat everybody else as having the same rights as ourselves. We don't set ourselves above other people. He's got another one that if, you know, if, if somebody's trusted to judge, if we're put on a jury, if we're, if we're put in a position of authority, it's a precept of the law of nature that you deal equally with people. You treat similar cases similarly. You don't play favorites. Again, why? Because if you start playing favorites, you're risking throwing society into chaos. He goes on, he's got a lot of other laws. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, in part because, you know, you, you see where this is going. What I want to finish up with talking about is asking the question, is this enough? And clearly for Hobbes, the answer is no. Why? 
He argues that we need something else in the mix, something that he calls a sovereign, or we could call authority or government. Why do we need this? If we're rational creatures, if we can see that this is the way that we ought to behave, if we've got this whole list of you know, character traits that we ought to be developing, like fairness or gratitude or agreeableness or you know, mild temper, why can't we just have the social contract and say, hey, we're, we're all going to agree to act this way. Um, each of you is on your own. I'll let you take care of your side of the street. I'll keep my side of the street clean. Well, Hobbes says that's not going to work. And when we go back to this, um, we can only seek peace if it's really possible. And given human nature, given the fact that people do change their minds over time, and we do tend to see things from our own egoistic, selfish perspective, and we do tend to have these you know, character traits that are different than the ones that we need in the state of nature, if you don't have some sort of authority there in place to punish those who break the social contract, pretty soon people are going to break the social contract. As a matter of fact, some will break the social contract. It's not just whether it's broken, it's how often it's broken, and whether it leads eventually to the social contract just being nullified. So the sovereign is what keeps the social contract in place as you know, the, a level playing field for the rest of us. But that means that the sovereign has to be above us. So it's not really a completely level playing field. The government, the authority, has to have not only more power than the rest of us, but the power to punish, including the ultimate punishment, which is death. It has to be able to banish us. It has to be able to tell us what to do. As a matter of fact, Hobbes, in, in reading selections that I, I didn't have you go through, but in other parts of Leviathan, will say that the sovereign, if it's really taking its job seriously, can't even allow other people to express their displeasure or you know, criticism of the sovereign. And any philosophies or any religious standpoints or any other standpoints that would call into question the absolute authority of the sovereign need to be banished from the Hobbesian commonwealth so that you're going to have a good society, so that people aren't going to break the rules, so that everybody can live in harmony, so that these passions can actually be fulfilled. Now, that's kind of a, a hard bargain, isn't it? It's something that you should really put a lot of thought into. If we're going to have a social contract, on the one hand, what is going to make us actually follow it? Are we good enough people to follow it on our own? If we were, we probably wouldn't need a social contract, would we? Because then the state of nature wouldn't be so bad, and we wouldn't need all these rules to get ourselves out of it. On the other hand... Do we want an all-powerful absolute, not absolute vodka, absolute sovereign that would have so much power, that would, that would be so high above all the rest of us and control our lives to such a, a drastic extent? Is that worth leaving the state of nature for? Hobbes thinks that it is. Hobbes thinks that nothing is worse than the state of nature. Even having some idiot who, you know, has corrupt ministers, you know, they're not going to last very long as a sovereign. But even that is better because you still have the social contract in place than the state of war of all against all. We might not see it that way, and not all other theorists did.